Hello. My name is uh, Hugo Cuevas Mor, Hugo Cuevas Mor. I'm the director of More World Consulting and the Platinum Network, which is bringing to you the IMTC conference. In my uh, work as a consultant, I have uh, for some time been speaking about uh, white label services or remittance as a service or RAS. And uh, I made this presentation so I can explain what remittance as a service is. And I have prepared the, this, this slides uh, in order to take you from how white labels are started in the retail business and how they have come of age in the financial services world. So thank you for being with me. Now, what is white label? White label products and services are rebrandable, resellable items that are produced by one company and to be rebranded and resold by another company. That's white label. The, provide, the providers of white label, they create a product and a, or a service to be rebranded by the reseller company and they can resell it as their own product with their own brand with their own pricing to end consumers because a company that is branding the product needs to do the sale of the product they normally are the marketing firm so it becomes a marketing exercise of selling products or services produced by others. I like the origin of the word white label because it comes from when record companies will produce a record, a long play, a vinyl record, and they will send it with a white jacket or white envelope to radio stations so they can play it in the air. And that it was called a white label and that's how the term originated but it's basically because there's no label in it so it's a white label or no label and the label is put by the company who eventually resells the product so in any white label agreement you have the provider or the producer of the product or the service and the reseller or the company that brands the product because the end consumer buys the branded product from the reseller and this reseller because it was sold twice now it's very important to understand that white labeling enables the resellers to expand their offerings without producing goods from scratch which allows them to quickly quickly scale their offering cost and revenue. So for example, China has been the largest producer of white label products. Any company in the United States, Canada, Europe, even other countries in Asia, they produce in China. China produces thousands of products that companies can rebrand and maybe they're branded in Europe differently than they're branded in the United States. So China has seen the has seen a major growth in the in their industries by producing products that are rebranded everywhere in the world. You can see here for example a company that produces uh, different products and they produce them for whoever wants to put their brand in it and sometimes they can change the packaging because it appeals more to the consumer in one place or another rebrand rebranding white labeling is, is used in retail for quite a number of years already let me explain that there is also uh, another term that is used is called private label and, and really it is the same thing 
So when you when you hear the word white label or private label, it's basically the same. The only difference is private label is more used in the in in retail for products for goods, and white label is used a little bit more for software for services. That's the only difference, but you can use them interchangeable. Now, a product or a service can be either white labeled or co-branded. So sometimes products need to have a brand in it, but the second brand or the co-brand has to be in it. Um, it's used. Uh, there is a certain value, so the customer knows that is that there is a brand in there or sometimes products that need a license to be sold that uh, the regulation requires that the producer of the service has his brand in it we're going to see that that's the case for a number of of, of services uh, in the financial sector now Outsourcing is another term that is used quite often, white label versus outsourcing. So outsourcing is really paying another company to do a function for your business. Um, it can be a continuous service like um, you outsource your customer service to a contact center. That, that is outsourcing. You can outsource uh, compliance. You can outsource even software development or integrations or or you outsource the uh, operation of certain thing that's outsourcing you can a uh, service or production of a product can be outsourced in many ways or and not necessarily has to be white labeled what is the pros of white labeling so first you benefit from your partner's experience you benefit from the experience of the producer of the service because they they've done it. It is it is probably out there in the market. Maybe another company has already branded it as their own. He has experience to produce that. So you gain you benefit all that experience this, that is that is there. That that product or service has has been tested. So there's another assurance that you are going to the market with a tested product. Um, you can expand your offering quickly. You can integrate a service, white label it, and in very few weeks or months, you can have it out there in the market. And so you have much more time to focus on growing your business instead of developing it from scratch. You can uh, leverage your resources and concentrate on marketing which you need to do anyway. If you have a product that you're going to sell it to the market, you need to spend in marketing, especially digital products. Digital products, you need quite um, an investment in marketing. So if you're going to do the marketing anyway, maybe you don't need to spend that much resources in developing a product or a service from scratch. Also, it is a win-win situation. Why? Because your partner, the producer of the service, wants to succeed, wants you to succeed. The, more, the bigger your success, the better for them, especially when there is revenue share um, agreements. Some companies might decide to go into producing white label products. Maybe they already have experience into the market and they feel that they can produce a service that can be rebranded by others. So they specialize in becoming the supplier of white label services. Another company might say, I prefer to be the reseller of that service, especially if you are new to a market and there is difficulty to for you to enter that market for many, many reasons, like we're going to see in some financial services, then you can spend less money and less time serving clients with a white label product. Those are basically the pros. We can talk about the cons also. 
a little bit later. So let's let let's move to uh, what um, as a service model means, and it is it's interesting because anything that is as a service, they it is X A A S. So X uh, is can be banking as a service, payment as a service, remittance as a service, as we're going to see. So X A A S refers to something that is presented to a customer as a service, and a service is normally something intangible. Remember, a product is a good, is something you can touch. Server is an intangible, but it's something that you are willing to pay for. So um, the first uh, SaaS services were um, cloud computing. You can, there's companies that provide cloud storage and they let you brand it as your own or software product they they you can brand it as your own they 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 they, they give the service on the back end they don't have to be branded you sell it to the to the consumer you put your own brand you put the marketing effort there's an uh, there's a term that is used uh, to describe this uh, service as a service models, which is flexible consumption models, FCMs. That's just another term that I that is it, it is used also. So in the literature, you find the flexible consumption model. They refer to this. Now there is IaaS infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is when, for example. I am a company and I have a data center, physical data center, and I can let companies resell the space that I produce, resell the servers and whatever I, I put in my data center. That's infrastructure as a server, uh, as a service, I mean. Servers, networking, storage, all of those are called infrastructure as a service. You have PaaS or platform as a service or payment as a service, where besides that infrastructure, you put some software in place, operating systems, database management, development tools, and then now you add infrastructure with the software and now you have a platform as a service now if you if you can increase your offering with uh, software as a service there is there are certain apps that you can have in your with the operating system that can perform certain functions that will be a, a software as a service and that's how uh, the the as a service model is incremental in the services you can stock up in on top of that and then you will see as we move ahead that uh, compliance um, licensing etc banking can put on top of that to increase the capacity of the offering of as a service model uh, let me give you some examples that some of the names you already know. Uh, SaaS, for example, Google Workspace, Dropbox, Dropbox you probably know, Salesforce, Cisco WebEx, GoToMeeting, Zoom. Uh, you, if you can brand it and and offer it, then then uh, Zoom also probably relies in infra infrastructure as a service platform as a service, Zoom brands it, delivers to the client and make probably makes improvements over whatever is using the back end. Uh, platform as a service is like Windows Azure, Google App Engine, OpenShift, etc. Infrastructure as a service, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, just to name uh, a couple. 
Now, a, a SaaS provider concentrates, as I said, on the back end, on the back office and the technological, technological side of the business. They develop a system that they can resell to you if you are the provider of the service to the client. The server's recipient then concentrates in the marketing of that end services. For example, payment as a service, uh, you can you can use prepaid debit cards and brand it with your name and all the back office, all the back engine is provided by credit card companies or by companies that have teamed up with this uh, credit card companies and deliver a product that you can brand in, uh, as your own and you can go to the end consumer with your prepaid debit cards with your internationally wallet, with your mobile wallets or locally wallets. There is more and more of this uh, service models where you can have digital products and you can put your brand into them. Now, what is the main benefit of SaaS? We talked about the benefits. But the biggest benefit is that they eliminate the cost and pains of having to design everything from scratch, build a new service, especially when you enter a new market. For example, if you come, if you are in Europe and you want to enter the United States and there's a lot of barriers to entry for many, many reasons, you might go with a service as a, as a service model for your entry into the United States or the other way around. So by outsourcing the entire process and leaving those details to the SaaS provider, then the seller can focus on branding and excel as marketing and really spend resources in the marketing side of it to grow, to grow this clientele. Digital services require a lot of technical innovation. You need to keep updating your, 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 your software. You have to become all the time better and better and evolve with technology. And the SaaS provider can provide this constant updates of the technology behind whatever you as the provider of the branded product you need. And that's costly. When regulation and licenses are involved, the benefits, of course, increase, as we're going to mention, when you have to come into a country like the United States and have to get 48 license just to become a money transmitter, for example. Now, businesses looking to develop new offerings can now easily outsource entire technological, technology stacks and tedious regulatory administration to other companies that are already doing this, they're, they have been doing that, they are experienced in doing that, and then you can concentrate on the other side, on the customer, on the reselling. Now let's discuss some of the cons of SaaS. You're locked in with a vendor. You have this product or service, you decide to going to business with that SaaS provider, you have a service in the marketplace, you're locked in with that vendor. It's, it's, it's complicated. In the retail side, maybe not as complicated. You can get another supplier that provides that product. In a service model, it's, it, it is a little bit difficult, more difficult. Integration support. You need to rely on the SaaS company to help you integrate your software, your service to, to maybe your own technology or other technologies. Maybe you, you, you need to have different SaaS providers, okay? Data security, you rely on the cybersecurity of the provider of the SaaS service. Sometimes you want to customize your product a little bit more because you want to go
going to a country where the customers require some differences in the way you, you provide the services. So you need to rely on, on the provider of the services to customize it or may, and because of that, you may feel that you lack a little bit of control over the service as a whole. Maybe you want more features uh, as you as you deliver the service, as your customers grow, maybe they start requiring some services, and then you have to you know turn around and tell your SaaS provider, I need these features. And maybe maybe they're too costly, maybe it is not beneficial, or whatever other reasons you are depending on that provider of the service for those features. Maybe there is some performance problems, maybe some downtime that you cannot control. So those are the cons and you have to think and analyze of the, your pros and cons and decide, okay, I like this, I don't like that, and, and just balance it, you know? Maybe, maybe you want to have more control for the business model that you have. Maybe those issues are not important, or maybe you analyze the provider of the service and you think that uh, they manage those cons, but you should be aware of them. Now, let me tell you something that is interesting. Banking as a service, uh, it, is, it is a new term, it is, it is new, but it's a key component to open banking. And open banking is a term that you've been hearing a lot, especially uh, new regulations, such as regulations in Europe, which they are forcing the banks to open the banking rails to fintechs to provide better, more efficient, and less costly service to clients. So they have to open their systems and some of the commercial banks may be resistant to that. They don't want to lose their client. They don't want to necessarily uh, be forced to open the systems that might have taken them a lot of uh, time or expenses to build. So there is new banking, digital banks coming along because they have found that yes, banking as a service is a product that they want to offer. They want, to, they want to develop a suite of products where fintechs can to tap in and they can, they can offer that. So in, in banks open their systems and they allow these third parties the access to their data and they can be very profitable doing that uh, because the retail banking is cha changing and there's fintechs coming with great solutions. If they use banking as a service, they can probably go to market faster or market the, the product better for the consumer. Open banking um, is global. There is, there is uh, regulators in many jurisdictions in the world, Canada, the US, Mexico, Latin America, especially Brazil, Chile, Europe, in Africa, um, in Asia, Hong Kong, for example, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. In all these places, um, there is open banking regulations um, that are requiring banks to open their systems, their banking rails. So these providers of financial services as as a solution, as a service, can increase the, the potential of the SaaS models in, that now exist. I went into the generalities of as a service model, just so we can get to this, to explain what does it mean remittance as a service or even payments as a service, cross-border payments as a service? So remittance as a service is something that has uh, come of age. There are few companies that have developed 
uh, RAS models. And uh, I think that uh, the first time I spoke about RAS probably was three, four years ago in an IMTC conference. And uh, I have heard from colleagues of mine that uh, were in companies that were discussing remittance as a service. Uh, I thought it was just, just just a great idea, and I thought that that was something that, that could really change the landscape of this industry. And now more than ever, I think that, because I think that 2021 on, there is going to be a boom in this market, and I think every company has to think about it, to analyze whether the RAS model is, is good for them as the, as the provider of the model or as the user of the model, both, both, both things. Now, these this RAS models, they serve the P2P side, person-to-person -person of the equation, but also there, there are some P2B for bill payment and there's a B2B business payments that are coming along but we're going to concentrate now to talk about P2P. If a company has a brand, wants to enter the US or the European P2P money transfer market with their own brand, I think that RAS is a service that they have to consider. Instead of going the long way, getting their licenses, etc., which they can do. Yes, while they were financial services or SaaS models are relatively new, I just said, but they're already part of the digital offerings in many markets worldwide, as we've seen with the banking as a service. Regulators, which were once skeptical, are now understanding the value of SaaS in the financial sector. Who can benefit from brass? At More World, we are advising institutions that are new to a market or might already have a clientele in the receiving inbound remittances to consider RAS as a solution. Example, a bank in Africa that has a clientele, a bank in Latin America, a payment provider, a brand that wants to provide the service in the United States. You can decide, okay, I can get licensed in one state and then build my licenses and grow, or they can decide to use a white label product so I can have my app with my brand in the US market in let's say three, four, five months. That's, that's what I'm talking here. Why I say a company that already has a brand? Because then it will be easier. The, the road to success will be quicker. But if you are a company that um, understands a market, an ethnic group, or it has already inroads in that ethnic group with a service, you might decide, okay, what if I also provide money transfers. If I provide remittances to my clients and I use a white label remittance as a service model, and then I am able to tell my clients, look at this, this is my brand, use my services. You can be, for example, um, ethnic chain, supermarket chain, or a tax service, or a courier service for a large community, and you think that it's important to offer also money transfer because your clients use other brands to send money home, and you can, and you can make inroads into that market. That's what RAS is for, for those kind of companies. So let's go back to the bank in, in, in Africa, or the bank in Latin America, or the uh, domestic payment system in an Asian country, you decide to discuss the possibility of a revenue share agreement with a remittance as a service provider. You can come with your brand, put your brand in the app and start 
by marketing, not only in the United States to those potential clients that know your brand, or you can also um, market in your own country, in your own market to your own clients, so they can tell their family members, the diaspora members to use that new branded pro product. If it's a brand that is known, then it maybe is a no brainer. Institutions that, that, that have loyal customers might think that, good, they are using my services, but if I can go in front of them with my own brand, I'll be very easy their top of mind. That's what we're talking here. Same thing in Europe. If you want to enter the European market, yes, in Europe, you can get a license, for example, in Spain, and then passport that license to uh, the rest of the uh, UE. But that takes time. It's an expensive way of doing it. It can be done. Many companies do it. We, in more world, with our office in Madrid, we provide that kind of service to companies that want to enter the European market, whether they want to get licensed in Spain or maybe the Netherlands, Portugal. Those three are normally preferable. Lithuania, of course, is, is also a country that has uh, done a lot of effort to attract companies to license there and then passport their licenses to the rest. UK was the was the first, but now with Brexit, it is really uncertain what is going to happen with companies licensing UK UK that now they are offering services in the other countries in the UAE in the UE, <laughs> the European Union. Sorry. So uh, probably those UK companies are going to have to uh, find a place to. To, to license themselves and then provide services for the rest of Europe. A number of companies have already done it. Um, many, many larger companies that were licensed in, in UK are already licensed in another European country, just to make sure that Brexit is, won't affect them. So let's move ahead because I want to um, also explain how mobile networks are also looking at this as a solution. If you're a mobile money provider in Africa, instead of probably uh, you offering your services in Africa to companies or banks in, the, in, in, other, in other countries, maybe I can use a RAS service and put my brand on top of a, an app or another mobile money and a mo mobile wallet and then provide a cross-border service that maybe uh, any other way will be just too difficult or expensive to do. So mobile networks are also considering a RAS model for them. We are advising companies from, from the get-go uh, to the development of a service as well as the targeted marketing campaigns they have to make uh, so that uh, RAS offering is success successful. Marketing is key, especially in digital services. So even if you, if, if you have a branded model, you have to market it. You have to reach your clientele. You have to be able to increase the amount of customers that are using your solution. I think I can could classify the offerings in the market uh, to two different models. One is a revenue sharing model where the RAS provider will sit down with you if you want to be the, the reseller and it will say, okay, let's make a deal. How long would you take to build, I don't know, 5,000 orders a month. 
7,000, 10,000 orders. And, and if there is a commitment in the number of orders, then they can come up with an agreement, which is a revenue share agreement. Let's say this um, FinTech in Africa or in Asia looks at that model and says, I have a good clientele, I have a good brand, I know my market, I can market the product, I can reach X amount of, of orders. And so the RAS provider says, yes, let's sign a contract, let's go ahead and then let's share whatever profits we make on the sending side. If you are the distributor in the receiving market, then that profit is yours. It, it's so you share in the sending market, probably you are not sharing that sending market uh, revenue. Now you just maybe a payer of orders, you're paying remittances as a bank or as a FinTech or as a mobile money network. And now you have access to share from the sending side. So that's, let's say the, 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 the revenue share model that some RAS providers are offering. The other one, I will call it an entry fee model in which uh, the RAS provider says, uh, you know, we'll provide you the system. We provide you with all the back offices, all what you need and the customer service, et cetera, et cetera. And you pay a fee, you pay, you pay a fee for, for the service. And then we make an agreement for uh, a monthly service fee. In, in, in those types of agreements, the reseller makes all the revenue. The revenue belongs to the reseller in the sending side. And if they, they do the distribution part, they will make also the revenue on the distribution side, but it's not um, a revenue share model. It's a service model. You pay for the solution, probably an initial fee, which can be, I don't know, 50, 60, $100,000, depending on, on, on the service and the provider, and then a monthly fee. The service is yours, you develop it, you own the revenue in, in, in its totality. You pay a cost. Those are the two models in place. Now, what those RAS models provide? What do they provide? So they provide the technology, the app, the online service model, you name it. They provide the, li the licensing. They are the licensee. They are the licensed company. They are the ones who are liable to the regulators in a state or in a country of that service. They um, have built uh, all the know your customer, all the compliance rules. They do all the um, alerts, the monitoring of the transactions. So everything checks out and everything is in place just to make sure those transactions flow and there is no, no, no um, money laundering. There is no terrorism financer. At least they manage the risk, let's say. Also, they manage the fraud that can happen when people might use debit cards that have been uh, stolen or any other way that fraud is committed. So the RAS model provides, as I said, the technology, the licensing, all the compliance and know your customer, the fraud detection, and all the all the contracts that need to be in place. So when a client uses that app to send money, all the fees are collected. The principal is then uh, passed to the dis 
distributor of the funds. If the distributor of the funds is the company that has a white label that product, then the payment is responsibility of that uh, of uh, that bank or fintech or mobile money institution in the paying side. Let's say you are not the distributor. You just want to provide the services. Maybe, or you are just a, a small uh, provider of payments in one country, in one region, and you can easily, with the RAS model, then have a whole many of countries or institutions that you can pay with, because depending on the RAS model, their distribution, you can also tap into those distribution channels that the RAS company has already put in place. So you don't have to go into all the settlements, all these integrations, all these contracts with with uh, distribution partners in, 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 in everywhere in the world. The RAS model already has that in place for you. So so that's that's the, the, the two models. That's what the RAS solutions uh, are offering. So maybe if you listen to me, you have a lot of questions in your mind. I'm, I'm ready to answer your questions. Um, some of the questions might require uh, longer talks, but that's what we do in Edmore World. I mean, we are advising companies because we do feel that um, this is the future. This is the future in the industry. And there is now already companies, banks, mobile money institutions that are coming up they are in the pipeline and they will uh, uncover their services and there will be new entrants into the money transfer world and they will grow uh, especially because they they probably have a very well-known brand or are committing the marketing resources to do that there is another term that i want to explain which is uh, the ipi solutions what I mean by that is that the some RAS providers don't need to provide the technology or the app or the mobile wallet for the user or the reseller. Maybe the reseller has already developed an app that is used in their domestic uh, market or that has other services in the wallet and they want just to add a money transfer button or another money transfer solution to their mobile wallet so they can also tap into a ras model and provide the money transfer services from their wallet to to towards um with a ras company and immediately have access to large number of countries where remittances can be paid. That's something that, that is important to, to, to know. If, if you're a provider of a service through a mobile wallet and you don't have remittance as a service, then this is a solution that, that, it, that is important to, to offer into the market. So what what happens there is just an integration of software integration through IPIs between your own mobile or online solution and the RAS company that is providing all the back end and is and so the integration is flawless the customer doesn't even have to understand exactly how the how we you know they move from one platform to to another it is important that to understand that the 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 future ahead is we in this market is integration and partnerships it's always been in the money transfer world partnerships between a company in the sending market and a company in the receiving market that's how this industry has grown now with technology, with this SaaS models, 
what we have seen is is that services are interconnecting and you really need to find out what piece of the puzzle you are or what piece of the, the puzzle you need to be more successful to streamline your operation to lower your cost and to produce a better service for your clients or maybe if you are uh, on the uh, on the back end what piece of the puzzle you can offer the market the money transfer the cross border money transfer and payments industry and as i said in the beginning we talked mostly about p2p but b2b or pas or payment as a service models are already being discussed they are being developed and I just cannot wait to meet the, a company that in the US or Europe is providing payments as a service, cross-border payments as a service, B2B. That I'm yet to find. So let's go into, into questions. I hope I was able to explain um, uh, the the RAS models for you, and uh, thank you for listening.